your host, Otasu Igbenedion and Ohimai Godwin Omaide. Good morning, Ohimai. Good morning, Osasu. How are you? Very well. It's a beautiful Saturday morning and you're looking gorgeous. Thank you so much. I'm wearing OT Couture. What are you wearing? I'm styled in Tesla Concepts from top to bottom. My Yoruba feel like everything. This As sports always, outfit. you're always wearing Tesla Concepts. Always Tesla Concepts. That's Definitely. Right. And come on, a little bit tells me you are now to be addressed as Chief Osasu. I actually am. I got a Chief wow, Tensi wow, title wow. in Abia. Wow, Osasu just got a Chief Tensi title in <laughs> Abia. She's now to be addressed as Chief. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. It just goes to show that the work that we do is being felt by everyone across the country. That's and it's right. truly That's uh, right. humbling. That's really but great. Yes, good morning to our viewers across the world. Uh, it's 8 a.m. here in Abuja, Nigeria's federal capital. And you're tuned in to the weekend show exclusively on Africa Independent Television. Of course, it's the show where we bring you the very best in politics, lifestyle, sports and entertainment. Don't forget to follow the conversation on social media at Weekend Show NG on all our various platforms, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Yes, so we have a packed episode for you today. We have distinguished Senator Dino Milai on our political segment. On lifestyle and entertainment, we have... Of course, we have the delectable King Tonto DK talking to us on entertainment exclusively this morning. And of course, on lifestyle, we'll be talking about xenophobia in South Africa with Chigo Udensi. And also we have a makeup artist, Vugo, talking to us this morning. As you can see, we have a plethora of topics to discuss. That's so right. keep it locked here on the weekend show and we'll be right back. Don't go nowhere. Welcome back to the weekend show. Right now, we'll take you through the headlines of the week. Uh, so much has happened this week. We had three governors decamp from the APC in the span of six days. The governor of Benue State, the governor of Kwara State, the governor of Sokoto State, the of Senate. The big one. The big one, the number three <laughs> citizen in the country, the Senate president. Oh. Oh, Lord. How is APC handling this? The APC is finally imploding. Hmm. But you see, the president did say that he's not perturbed by the fact that these people are leaving the party. But he called a late midnight meeting with senators immediately after the senators decamped from the APC the other day. Is it a case and of actions and words not and necessarily of course, matching? Uh, we're, we're getting reports right now that uh, he's, he's proceeded on a vacation. Attend a vacation to London. So does that mean he really isn't disturbed <laughs> by the fact? a lot of commentary on social media suggests that the president is troubled and needs some rest. <laughs> wow. Well, there are two ways you can look at that. There's one that, oh, I don't care what's going on. You know, let me just <laughs> take care of myself. And another one is like, well, let me just refresh from all this well, decamping well, going on. Well, clearly these are not the best of times for, for the ruling party. Definitely. This is more like a throwback to what happened in 2014 mm -hmm. when five governors staged a walkout. Yes. from the PDP convention and uh, that clearly decimated the then ruling part of the PDP and led to the loss of the 2015 presidential elections on the part of but Good Luck Do you foresee the impact that that had, the NPDP uh, moving out of the then, then ruling party? Do you foresee the same impact replicating itself in 2019? Do you think that the camping of these key figures, because initially when we had people decamping in, you know, House of Rep and uh, State House of Assemblies. We weren't too disturbed because mm -hmm. we said, even when they formed the coalition, the COP, uh, Coalition of United Political Parties, we said there was no heavy weight at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. But um, eventually, when you have sitting governors, the Senate president, and soon to come, I hear, uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives exactly. still pending. Um, is this really something that you believe should be truly worrisome or do you believe that the power of the incumbency would still triumph over this defection? Well this looks to me like an approaching tsunami. You know when a tsunami approaches it's when it's yet to make its final damage 
you know, you, you can see it approaching. In the case of the MPDP in 2014, it happened in one first swoop. But what makes this particularly disturbing is the fact that it's, it's happening, happening in, trickles. in trickles. They're prolonging the They're effect. prolonging the torture and the trauma exactly. that this has for the ruling party. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> but you know, when we also horn down to what's going on in these individual states, so take exactly. Benway, for Benway, instance. Benway, for instance. Eight lawmakers out of 30 in attempted to impeach the governor of the state. Is that, is that not what Fireshare calls a case of legislative rascality? rascality. <laughs> Obviously, that can hold. So, so in order to form a quorum, you need two-thirds of the State House of Assembly. Precisely. And two-thirds is 20 out of 30 lawmakers. So I'm not quite sure how they got the maths wrong in that situation. That's political mathematics. Oh, Lord. But uh, that's, I, I see that as a political miscalculation. Of yes. course, it's not going to stand. It's not going to work. Uh, well, we'll see how that plays out. We saw the case of the National Publicity Secretary of the APC, the image maker of the party, yes. who moments after Saraki, his principal, defected, has also said he's living. You know, living. while I found that very interesting, because when the story broke, um, uh, I think it was on a Tuesday, yes. um, he came out to, to say, say... he had not yet he resigned. Had, he, exactly. He, he said he had not resigned, and yes. he, remained, he remained a member, member of, the of the APC. And the and next 24 day, hours later, 24 hours later, he issues a statement that he saying that... I'm done. I'm living. Some people are saying that the chairman, Adams Oshomale, forced him out of the party. Do you well, think the, there's the any Well, the conditions to were, were looking very, very impossible for him to remain in the party. Clearly, from his statement, the APC did not want anybody that was aligned or perceived to be aligned to the Saraki camp to still be in the party. Definitely. So, and there were cases of insubordination. His subordinates were being asked to take over responsibilities that were supposed to be his. Mm -hmm. And um, the man felt that it wasn't worth it at all. And, had wow. to and a bit of a background story to that. We know that uh, Bolaji Abdullahi, the APC Publicity Secretary, was minister under Good Luck Jonathan's uh, exactly. administration. And, and took when, a bullet for Saraki. Yes, and when Saraki <laughs> had decamped, one of the NPDP governors to decamp to APC, uh, Bolaji Abdullahi resigned his position as minister. So he was actually asked to leave the cabinet by Jonathan then, which made so him very him, quiet. So with him, he said he had resigned, and another angle of the story was that he was asked to leave. So there's still that contention. Contention. Yes, but I well, know you worked very closely with him yes. so i'm sure you have the inside scoop to that but malam abdullah was actually flying he was actually in the air when the news of him being asked to leave the cabinet broke so he wasn't even was it in the media or was he sent a private email no email he didn't get a letter it was just announced in wow. the media wow was, uh, that's uh, his resignation or his no, termination that he was being asked to leave Wow. It was quite uh, funny. Politics. <laughs> it's, always, it's always so interesting. It's what it is, politics. But, um, I wish we could give you some more headlines. Unfortunately, we do not have enough time because we have a packed episode for you on today's program. But when we return, we'll take you through that. So stay tuned. My broadcast experience has been a wonderful one. I've come to uh, believe that saying that broadcasters are born and not made. When AIT started, I think there were just about two or three private stations, but now we have so many. So one of the challenges is to make sure you're not beaten, to make sure whatever the competition is doing, you're even doing much more to keep the eyeballs on your station. It's been rewarding working with AIT, sharing the African experience, being a part of the dad dream. I'm still here, I'm still here. <laughs> still going to contribute my own quota to that, and of course, to the broadcast industry. My name is Tosin Dokwesi. You're watching AIT. Hello everyone, welcome once again to the weekend show. This is the lifestyle segment and we are talking xenophobia in South Africa. And I have a very interesting guest in the studio this morning. His name is Chigo Udensi. He is a political scientist and expert on xenophobia and international conflicts within Africa. Chigo, 
thanks for coming to the studio this morning. Thank you, Ohi. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. How are you doing? Very well. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Yeah, so xenophobia in South Africa, you've lived in South Africa for eight years. You've yeah. studied in South Africa as a student, you've lived there. How have you managed to escape being caught up in the conflict <laughs> of xenophobia? Okay, uh, first of all, I'll put it to you. Uh, the idea of xenophobia in South Africa is, is uh, primarily uh, social uh, intolerances and how the society reacts to it. So if, if you're living on the, on, on, on the good side of the society, I don't think you will be caught up with the xenophobia as a, as a measure to address how you live there. That's oh, how I say it, yeah. Interesting, interesting. So now let's, let's talk pop culture. Okay. Uh, when I hear about xenophobia in South Africa, South Africans don't want foreigners, black foreigners, particularly co-Africans in their country, and Nigerians being on the receiving end of the violence, I want to ask myself, do they also transfer that aggression to Nigerian pop culture? How has xenophobia in South Africa, for instance, influenced the consumption of Nigerian music, Nigerian fashion? Is there fashion xenophobia? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, let me attack the, the, the issue of xenophobia again. Xenophobia is not only focused on Nigerians, you should know that, I'm sure you do. Xenophobia is it's about uh, uh, a display of, let me say it again, it's a display of intolerance to activities, to uh, 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 social abnormalities as they perceive it there. So if there's something they like from anywhere in the world, they'll accept it, which includes Nigerian music, they love it, Nigerian culture, South African, they love our cultural attires and they often buy them. So if I understand what you're saying, the, the xenophobia we have seen in South Africa is a reaction to what they don't like about the foreigners who so to speak, have invaded their space. Exactly. And so what are some of these things? Oh, well, some of the things that they don't like, the fact that they see most foreigners as a criminal and the opportunistic threats to their society. So they will react in ways to stop you from being in those places, or they will show a violent protest to show the government that they don't want you here or they don't like what you're doing. Oh, okay. I'll take you back to, your, to the first question, uh, how you've managed to survive being caught up in the conflict and um, can you give me a narration? Have you actually been caught up? Have you actually been through or narrowly escaped being attacked? <laughs> or have you had someone, a personal person, someone very close to you, a friend or a relative who got caught up in this whole violence? Okay, uh, the 1994 charter of the independence uh, 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 the independence charter of, 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 the, of the Republic, the Rainbow Nation, it states that uh, South Africa is for South Africans and everyone who is in South Africa. So you as an immigrant coming into South Africa, South Africa is for you. Now you, you, you embody an identity of whatever you're doing, whatever you're there for. So say I'm there for education, so I'm a Nigerian student in South Africa. That's my identity, right? <laughs> so I've taken, that, I've taken the identity as this is what I'm doing here. So by virtue of my identity, I know that these are my boundaries and these are things I should be doing. And this is how I should live in South Africa. So as a Nigerian student in South Africa, I don't expect to be attacked by xenophobic sentiments or xenophobic violence. So you've never been attacked? I've not been attacked, but I've been in areas where there is xenophobic sentiment. Who are you? I'm a Nigerian student. And you've had to and identify yourself I, as a course. Nigerian student, and you, still you, you got away without being attacked. I wasn't attacked. I've, right. had, I've had situations where I've actually taken the wrong taxi and uh, the taxi driver called me out and it's like, you look like a, 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 good, a good guy, but I know you're a foreigner. I said, yes, I am a foreigner. And he says, okay, come with me, and this is how you go out. He took me out. A South and African driver. A South African driver. That's because they understand that not all people are bad people. And in the context of being bad, it's not only foreigners that are bad. Criminality is a big thing in every country. Every country has the way of dealing with it. So if that's their own way of dealing with it, Nigeria has their own way of dealing with it too. So, so would you say the xenophobia we've seen in South Africa has a cultural dimension to it? Uh, is this uh, something <laughs> cultural to the South African people? Yes, I would like to put it that way. It is actually. Is, is it their way of responding to what seems like an attempt to, like I said, invade their space and uh, 
uh, try to take over what they have and um, is, is it something cultural to them? What would you, what, what, what do you think? I would actually agree with you on that. It's, uh, it's more of a cultural thing. It's more of a way of uh, showing their, again, the intolerance towards uh, something that they don't like, something they perceive they don't like. Because I wouldn't say they only attack Nigerians, again, or foreigners. Also, their own people who go against the social norms, they also give them the same measures. The same treatment. Exactly. So when it happens to a South African, then you say, oh, this is violence against a South African. But when it happens to a, a Nigerian, it's xenophobia. OK, now, the, the, the challenge I have with this whole xenophobia thing is pictures we've seen online on the internet about people being lynched and killed and in an opera of violence. In all that confusion, it seems to me like anybody can get caught up whether you are criminal or you're not criminal. Like you're a student, you're studying in South Africa, you have nothing to do with drugs and crime. Yeah. But you could just get caught up unluckily. So, and that's the danger that I see in this uncontrolled and unchecked, you know, outrage that we have seen mostly coming from South Africa. Because innocent people, people who have not committed any crime at all, could get caught up. Don't you think so? That's the dangers of xenophobia people who are innocent, who have nothing to do with the crime, being caught up. You know, it's very unfortunate again, uh, but at the same time, there's always a build up to events. Things don't just spring out from nowhere. First of all, it starts as uh, sentiments. Sentiments become facts, you know, facts get widely spread very quickly. And before you know it, people start having irritation and uh, showing agitations towards those sentiments that have become fact. And they want to show that they actually feel the pain because they maybe don't know of better ways to project their ideas or project their sentiments to the government, for the government to react in ways that makes the Nigerian people understand that, we, no, we're not happy with you for this, or make the, uh, the other foreign citizens to understand that, no, we're not happy about this or that, you know, miscommunication might come in the way. I see. But being caught up is, ve is a very strong, unfortunate possibility. Interesting. Okay, now back to pop culture. Um, okay. So you said whenever xenophobia, xenophobic attacks break out in, in South Africa, okay. it's not also transferred to, you know, Nigerian products or Nigerian uh, culture, music, fashion. So if during an, a xenophobic outrage, for instance, mm -hmm. I walk into a South African club, okay. is it likely that I will hear the music of Whiskey, Davido, The Bunch playing? In fact, if you walk into a South African club, 90% of the music you hear is Nigerian music. If, if there is a Nigerian session going on or if there's a normal session going on and you walk in there, you hear a lot of Nigerian music going on. Wow. Yeah. So, so, it's so South nothing. Africa is heavy in terms of consuming Nigerian products, pop culture wise, music, fashion, lifestyle. Definitely b beyond our normal export of uh, oil to South Africa, which is over 90% of our export, the most things we do uh, export to them, culture-wise, like you've mentioned, part of our music, our culture. Interesting. Okay, now, rewind back to a couple of years ago. Uh -huh. There was a time in Nigeria where, you know, we had Ghanaians okay. predominantly living here. Ghana. And then the Ghana Must, <laughs> Ghana must Go syndrome came up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, the Ghana Must Go syndrome came up. Yeah. And a lot of Ghanaians had to, had to go flee, back. had to run out of this country and go back to their country. Would you describe that as some sort of xenophobia from Nigerians targeted at Ghanaians? This is xenophobia. <laughs> <laughs> this is xenophobia. <laughs> but, but it didn't have to, it didn't degenerate to the killings no, and the kind of bloodshed that we've seen no, in but South you, Africa. I'll get to that in a bit. You agree with me, when they have the, uh, the Ghana Must Go uh, saga going on, the, the, the Nigerian and the Ghanaian uh, communities came to, or uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the politicians, the government came together and had, uh, they had the quick res resolution for it. And yeah. the, you know, they had the quick uh, way of mitigating any further uh, uh, violence. There was destruction of properties, yes. But uh, losing of lives, not sure about it that. It didn't, get, it, it didn't get that far. It didn't get that far. Now, <laughs> with the idea of uh, the uh, lynching of people and that, let's look at it from this aspect. South Africa is coming from uh, a point where they they are about 24 years in uh, yeah from about 24 years in independence, and uh, I like to take it from the point of independence. How did they get the independence? Through the Nzabala Zongebo, through the struggle 
one good you, you know so you, you, you started speaking south african language i uh, just a bit okay. <laughs> okay. so carry on please so <laughs> well, let's look at it from that point where our independence was more negotiated we had to sit down with the, the very educated uh, people who were given chances to do that but theirs was more of a struggle and uh, a hard struggle to independence and I like to think for them that's th that's their ideology of an emancipation how you get things done how you get your way out you know don't wait for the government to do it you know go out there and you have the toy toy you know mm. you have to uh, march for it and it's part of their culture it's part of something they have uh, put in with them uh, of which uh, a lot of educated people have understood not to get involved with. but we're talking about a country where about 27% of the population are unemployed now that number that's unemployed they are the youths. We're talking about nine point something million people who are uneducated. They still have that knowledge in them. They still have the understanding of this is how we have to show that we are angry. We want this, you know, mm. you must give us. So when they come down with you with their attitude, you, you, you must understand that this is where they're coming from. It's not like they, they come out of the blues and say, oh, we're going to kill you or something. They still have it in them that they will attack you, you know. They still have that violence in them because this is where we come from, and we are unemployed. We are still unemployed. You know, we are still uh, economically disadvantaged. So we have to find a way to get our way, or we push it off the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Talk, talking about unemployment, uh, I was going to come to that. Okay. The the part of what we've heard okay. from South Africans, uh, people who spearhead this xenophobic outrage, has been the fact that they feel that these foreigners have come to take away from them what they have their jobs, the little opportunities for jobs that are available to them. So Nigerians have come to compete with them on that limited space of opportunity. But the flip side of that argument also is that most of the, there are, there are very big uh, South African companies who are playing, you know, predominantly in the Nigerian market. You have DSTV, you have MTN, you have a couple of South African brands who are operating in Nigeria and we've received them with very open arms. They've made lots of billions of dollars off the Nigerian economy, and nobody is, nobody really cares. <laughs> well, look at, again, looking at the societies where they are, looking at, at the, the economic uh, aspect of the society. In South Africa, you have a, 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 a community where people are trying to meet up with the opportunities that are there. And why trying to meet up? with the requirements or with the standards for this opportunity. There are people who are more qualified. So you, you won't tell a society to hold up, you know, slow down, you know, wait for other people to meet, you know, to meet up. Of course, businesses want to thrive. So if you see a foreigner who's got the skills you want, you'll take him, right? Exactly, you take the foreigner in and put him in the system. So are you saying that more foreigners or, or, or the foreigners who come into South Africa are a lot more educated and better qualified than the South African young people who need these jobs? <laughs> okay, this is Could that be an issue? This is one aspect of it. Uh, I wouldn't say it's outrightly an issue, but uh, the aspect of diversity and the fact that uh, you, you want different ideas and you want different skill sets that may not be in South Africa at the moment, or, or was not in South Africa at the moment, you know, because the education level in South Africa is growing now. But it's it, quite it's actually a lot better than in some, <laughs> most parts of Africa. Of course, me. it is better in most parts of Africa. But then... Not than most parts of Africa. It's better than, than quality most parts. Of quality of the education quality of in education South Africa is widely considered as much better than what you, what you have elsewhere in Africa. Of course it is. So why is this education dis uh, gap, this disconnect, why, where is it coming from? The education disconnect with yes. the issue of getting jobs. Jobs by young South African, South African youths, especially in the black community. I like the way you mentioned it, the black community. The issue of jobs. The jobs are there. The jobs are coming up every day. People are going to school getting educated and getting fit for these jobs. But what about the population that are not educated, that don't have the means? Now you're talking about the few advantaged ones. What about the ones who are disadvantaged, who are in the locations? You know? Is that then an indictment on the South African government? <laughs> <laughs> the South African, 
Not as much. No, no. Thank you, Chigo. I guess that's a great place to leave it on the weekend show lifestyle segment this morning. We've been talking xenophobia in South Africa. It's been quite an interesting conversation with Chigo. Thank you, Ohi. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming. And please, viewers, stay tuned. Don't go nowhere. The weekend is going to be back shortly. back to the show guys welcome to the lifestyle segment now of course you already know my name you know Peter, and i'm here with somebody very extraordinary he's a makeup artist that is definitely definitely making waves in the business welcome vugo how thank you thank you very much i'm doing fine you look amazing thank you <laughs> all right well for, for just those of us still living under the rock just tell us a little bit about yourself okay my name is is it chukugo chuku victor probably known as vugo 24. um i'm a male makeup artist in nigeria abuja all right, so tell us how you know makeup started for you. When did you decide to go into this business? Well, for me, um, it's passion. It's um, something, I, I didn't just start makeup. I used to be a, an artist. Okay. I used to be a painter, I draw, I paint, I mold, I sculpt, I do a lot of artworks. Okay. So um, initially for me, uh, I just, I used to be also be a designer. So I'm still a designer. So I started out by, by drawing and painting my mom, my younger sister. I loved um, uh, Monroe, the red lipstick lady, and, <laughs> and I, all that stuff. So I loved doing those uh, lines on the liner, on the gel liner, yeah. the eyeshadow, the colors. I love playing with colors a lot. Okay. So that's how I started. Then later on, I decided to transfer it to the face. Okay. It's not the paper or the, or the canvas. And has it been ever since then? Yes, yes. It's has been, been amazing. All right, great. So, you know, back then, makeup wasn't all of this mm -hmm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know like people will literally wake up in the morning and just wash their face you know how our forefathers like yeah our forefathers will do you know our <laughs> foremothers you know, will just wash their face and you know people are good to go but yes. now there's so much and it makes people to now people are beginning to say you know that um makeup is deceitful you see pictures on social media you're seeing people you know um looking like a and then when they're done with the makeup it's completely different yes. so a lot of people feel like people that put makeup on are you know wearing this artificial face what do you have to say about that considering the fact that you are a makeup artist well for me um i would say my own um kind of makeup is a type that enhances your beauty because mm -hmm. i don't i don't know how to transform it from being d from being a to being b mm -hmm. and all i do just enhance your beauty yeah. you look more natural I go on my page, most of my looks are very, very natural. I don't have to do that heavy, whole, that whole oh, one bell look and draggy yeah. looky. I'm not, I'm not that kind of makeup artist. For me, I feel you should keep it simple. 
clean and classy. Okay, so why, is, also, why is makeup so time consuming? You see people oh. spending hours. I, I mean, I keep asking myself that same question because um, I've noticed I have probably I've been told so many times I'm the fastest makeup artist. Ooh, yes. Okay, okay. Yes. Because <laughs> for me, I think makeup takes me, say, 15, 20 minutes. So. Really? We're oh, definitely faster. going to sit down and then we'll yes. do this timing. Okay, because I feel most people, there's a, this whole YouTube. Um, tutorial thingy they keep going through the whole okay they do the liquid contour do the powder contour do the liquid highlight do the powder highlights man it's too much drama really yes there are better ways of doing these things you get i feel people just need to find out what works out for them mm -hmm. and perfect it more okay. and most times again i feel um well, I think I'm just perfect when it comes to doing makeup, so it's not my fault. Okay, yes. okay, 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 really, I mean, I like this vibe, really, because you know, sometimes you have to look into the mirror and tell yourself, yeah. Honey, like, you have to, yes, <laughs> you have to. <laughs> All right, so, um, you know, ever since, you know, that you've been doing this makeup mm. now, tell us about your clientele, how many, you know, how you charge, and how it's just been working with all the famous people that you've okay, worked yeah, with. Okay, um, yeah, I started um, in a little way. In a little way, I used to charge very little, but with time, the demand became higher. So, so many people uh, have been um, requesting for my services. So, I devised a means of, which is in economics, you have mm -hmm. to the higher the, um, whatever, the higher the price goes, yeah, okay. the higher the demand, the higher the price. Yeah. Yes, so that stabilize your movement. Mm -hmm. So, um, now I charge um, averagely, I once I charge really high, I charge average at least for everyone to be able to afford me. Well, okay. um, with that, for me to be able to um, curb the uh, demand, I also have assistants who I work with. Okay, yeah, great. so we charge as low as 10,000, 20, 30, 40, depending on you your budget. You're saying 10,000 is as low as? Yeah, that's, that's really cheap. Do you know how much of a bottle of foundation goes? Ooh, yes. okay. <laughs> All right, so um, we know you work with um, Nollywood actress Tony to Tell yes. us how that has been like, you know, just working well, with Well, I keep telling people that has been really amazing. Like, it's been everything. It's been all I ever dreamt of when I was a child. Yes, I've always wanted to be on that spotlight, and she just did exactly that for me. Talking about spotlights, yes. so we did, you, we know you appear in her reality show. Mm, right yes, I, I am. Yeah, so what was that like, you know, just filming, seeing people come moving around you with cameras? I mean, okay, no, no, you don't really see people moving around you with cameras. Really like yes, they're mostly planted. Yes, like you're in the house, you don't even know the cameras are hidden. Mm -hmm. Um, except restricted to your bedroom. Okay. Yes. Um, your cars, there are cameras planted everywhere. So when you're going, um, maybe whenever I want to go shopping, there's people already planted in the mall where I have to go shopping. Talking about shopping, ah. there was this thing that was circulating <laughs> everywhere yes. that you took her credit cards mm. and then you went shopping and you spent and she was furious. No, Give us the real thing. <laughs> Tell us the real tea. Uh, okay, okay. Well, I'll just say I, I, I went over my uh, boundary a little bit. Mm. But it's something that was supposed to be done because I needed products for her event the next day and I didn't have products. So she told me I was supposed to shop in Lagos and I did the need for. Okay. But you don't know, went a bit overboard. Yeah, like, well, it's not really a bit overboard, but that was like a shopping card. It's not as if it was a main account. Okay. She was not like I was with a main, main account <laughs> number. She would have cried. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, you know, um, let's go to the personal side because okay. I have to ask. I mean, okay. we're getting the tea, right? Mm -hmm. So tell us, who is a special person? Um, sorry, you say what? So, who is a special person in your life? Don't, well, don't. Um, yes, answer. My mom. <laughs> 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 well, that that part, that part, you guys have to find out yourself. Yes, really? yes. So you know, if you just drop one, even just tinini. No, I don't think the person would like it. Are you serious? Yeah. Why? Like, I like keeping private things private. Why? Why in like public? I mean, you know, there are a lot of nosy people out there. They'll have to they'll have, but well, they already have things to say. But keep them busy. Okay. Yes, they they have they have data, so they I need them to use it. Yeah. All right, all right. Well, they 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 can watch the show and eventually because you're going to be a regular face on the show. So oh, okay. maybe one of these days nice. you spill the tea. Hmm. Yes. But you know these things change now. Today this person is that person. You never yeah. can tell. Things ah, happen. Look at you. Uh -uh. I'm a hot boy now. What do you expect? <laughs> I beg, I beg, I beg. <laughs> Okay, okay. So yeah, I saw on social media yeah. Yeah, something happened. The lady was like, uh, she she got a makeup artist to do her makeup, mm -hmm. you know. And then when she now the makeup artist found out it was for a particular event where that you know she told her something different rather. She was furious, you know. You told me this was for you know a birthday party, and then it turned out to be 
a wedding. Yeah, that and thing she was angry. To me. Why? Like it happened to me. I don't know why I put that a lot. Well, I feel Why do you guys feel the need to charge differently? That's my that's my question. Okay, really. now for me, when it when it comes to bridal, um you it means you booking for the whole day. Like I have to be there for your uh, first makeup when you're going to church and I have to be there to dap you um in because Obviously, makeup can't last for 24 hours. Come on, we're not, we're not God, mm. you get. We're not magicians. So, definitely, I have to be there on standby to do your touch up every time. Because after the church, you have to come out to take pictures. After you have to have the reception. So, I have to be there. It's like for you booking for that 24 hours. So, I'm charging you like, if I, if I charge 30k for home service for like, a, um, for like a, per event, and um, in a day I have like, say, eight, nine clients, how much would that be? 10,000 times 9 or times 8. So I'm going to just out of the bill, like, okay, for that whole day, I'm not having any client, just you, the bride. Yeah. So I have to, like, include that into your bill. And again, uh, the products we use for bridal, they are, they are quite expensive and um, they are, um, how will I put it, they are more sophisticated, they are more expensive. So okay. those products we use, actually, because from the spray, they have the bridal spray, all those But it doesn't take away the fact that, you know, the products we're using for the other makeups, you know, are not uh, Less. good. Yeah. No, they are good, but like for your foundation like um, if i'm using uh this br a, a brand of um, foundation mm -hmm. i'm supposed for a, a regular makeup i'm not supposed to use that same a brand because most time it can wear out mm -hmm. i have to use like c something higher okay like that's that's what it for me i don't know for them artists actually but for me that's what i do i use um uh, a more how like it's just something better I get for you. the makeup to last and, and i feel like and when it comes to the lashes the product are like the lashes are like more human like, like human hair mm -hmm. or like the regular Makeup, I do. Okay, yes. all right, great. So, I'm um, talking about you know this product. What are tell me your top five products that every female should have in oh. her handbag? God bless the butter, <laughs> <laughs> as in, she she has the best foundation ever. That I okay, yes, you should try her foundation now. For her foundation, it's amazing. Mm. Once you have a foundation, your lip gloss and your lashes, you're good to go. I said five, so foundation, lip gloss, lashes, so two more. Um, what else? Two more is being too much. Okay. That just is just perfect. All right. Yes, because except if you don't have, except if you have bad brows, then you need the brow pencil and brow filler to fill it up. All right. But if you have a flawless brow like mine, honey, just put on a foundation and gloss with the lashes. Oh, uh, you're you good go. to go. <laughs> <laughs> the energy I'm getting here is just you know, out of this world, really. Oh All right. God. So I'm gonna let you go. Mm -hmm. But one more thing. I mean, you're a makeup artist. We have to get something from you. How about we must learn from you? Okay. Tell us one quick beauty tip now that ladies can use and we'll just look fabulous. Honey, honey, listen to me carefully. Just blend. Whatever you do in your face, blend properly because I don't want to see those harsh white lines under your brows. I don't want to see the lash, the harsh line between the contour and your whatever you have on your face. The glow, the glow that is standing out, please blend it inside and set it with spray so it sinks in. Mm. That's all I have to say. All right, great. Thank you so, so much Thank for really coming much. on the show. Thank you. And um, I hope we have you on the set, you know, very soon. Uh, sure, I'll be and glad to. we will definitely do our investigation <laughs> you know, on the private. No, we like to No, definitely you'll find out. This thing. She's not someone who is hidden. She's a, she's a public person, so. Oh. Yeah, she's There's a she, people. <laughs> there is a she. I got it out. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much thank for coming. You. This was definitely amazing. We will okay. see you very soon. Thank you very much. Have a great time. You and over see you. Give me beauty tips. Oh, after definitely. Night. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, don't go anywhere because the show continues. The weekend is just starting. And we have so much more for you. Please stay.